Whenever I see a Plymouth Superbird, the first word that comes to mind is outrageous. Hi there, Rick DeBrule here at the Martin Auto Museum with another collector car profile. The Martin Auto Museum here in Phoenix, 170 cars spanning the full spectrum of the automotive world. It's a must-see location. And this is part of that collection, a 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Why outrageous? Well, I mean, first off, just look at it. That sharp nose on the front, that big wing on the back. Of course, this was created not for the street, but to go racing in NASCAR. But NASCAR rules back then said that they had to make a certain number of these before they could go NASCAR racing. They had to make it official. So they made one, well, technically, for every Plymouth dealer in the country. There's around 2,000 of these that were made. And the reason it's outrageous is because you could go into a Plymouth showroom and buy one of these things. You could drive it on the street. But it's also interesting and outrageous that back then, a lot of people didn't want to do it. In fact, a lot of the Plymouth Superbirds from 1970 did not get sold. In fact, they were still sitting on dealers' lots as late as 1972. And some dealers, it would be heresy today, they actually chopped off the nose, they chopped off the wing, so that it would be more appealing and look just like a regular Roadrunner, and they would sell it. Now, today, there are actually companies that make kits where you can take a Roadrunner and make it look like a Superbird. So you might want to be a little careful if you're looking at buying one. But back then, they were doing the exact opposite, just to get them off of the showroom floor. So let's talk about the history of this car. Why does it exist? Well, only for one reason, and that's to go NASCAR racing. So in 1969, Dodge came out with the Dodge Charger Daytona. Same concept. They took their Dodge Charger, which was pretty much an aerodynamic brick. They put the big sharp front end on. They put the tall wing on the back. And guess what? It did pretty well. And Richard Petty, who was a Plymouth guy, had raced Plymouth for a long time, said, hey, I want one of those. And Plymouth was like, I don't think we're really ready to go there. So in 1969, Richard Petty defected. He went from Plymouth to Ford. He raced in Ford in 1969. And Plymouth went, well, you know what? That Charger thing, that Daytona may not be such a bad idea. We got to get Richard Petty back over here so we can win. Let's come up with our own version of that. And they took the Plymouth Roadrunner, which was a fairly well-selling car. Remember back in 1969, they put the similar nose on the front, the similar wing on the back, and they went racing. And they actually had some success, quite a bit of success. Richard Petty, in fact, won eight races in 1969. Now, when I say that it's similar to the Dodge Charger Daytona, that's the key word. And if you look closely when you see the nose, You'll look and you'll see, well, there are some differences. For example, the Charger Daytona nose has a little uh, air inlet on the bottom. This does not have it. And the angle on the wing on the back, well, that's different as well. So while they took the same basic concept, it was just a little bit different in the way they were doing it. You had your choice of three engines when you bought a Superbird. You, of course, could get the big dog. That was the Hemi, producing more than 400 horsepower. And you had your choice of two different 440s, a four-barrel or a six-barrel carburetor setup on those. Very potent engines, no matter which one you took. And the standard transmission when you bought a Roadrunner Superbird, well, it was the automatic transmission. The extra transmission was the four-speed. So what were the differences between a Roadrunner and a Superbird? Well, of course, obviously, we've got the aerodynamics in the front, and we've got the aerodynamics in the back. And interestingly, this aerodynamic nose, well, that's not made of fiberglass. That is actually made of steel, although I believe that the headlight covers are made of fiberglass. But the nose itself was steel. Same with the back. I mean, this was designed to go racing in NASCAR, and so they had to be pretty strong. Well, the Superbird was mostly a roadrunner. There were some changes that they had to do to make it a Superbird. And one of them had to do with the rear window. This is not a rear window out of a roadrunner. That's because they wanted it to be more aerodynamic. If you look at a roadrunner, well, it's got this little triangular piece right here. It comes down. It's not as smooth aerodynamically as this window is. So if you look at a Superbird, what you'll notice is, number one, it's rounded right here in the corner. And number two, it's got this little triangular piece. Because once again, they wanted it to be aerodynamically just a little smoother as it worked its way back towards that big wing in the back. And remember, you can't change out a Roadrunner window, rear window, for a Plymouth Superbird rear window because of that. There are some other changes. Of course, you've got these scoops, if you want to call it that, reverse scoops, that are over the front tires. And aerodynamically, why did these exist? Well, of course, they existed so that they could help the air exit out and 
so they didn't have that problem of the aerodynamic turbulence inside the wheel well. But officially the word when they were trying to get these through NASCAR was that they needed these for wheel clearance. There were also some other changes underneath to the suspension, but to be honest with you, it did not make a lot of changes. Why is that? Well, the reality is that they didn't just take a Superbird and go racing with it stock off the showroom floor. When Petty Enterprises got their Superbirds, the first thing they did was make massive changes. If you looked under the hood, say, of Richard Petty's Superbird from 1970, the one he raced in NASCAR, the reality is it would look a lot different than what you see in this one. That's because while NASCAR wanted the outside of the car to be as dead stock as possible, they allowed a lot of modifications underneath the hood by 1970. I mean, back in the 50s, of course, it was literally a stock car that they would go racing and buy it on Friday and race on Sunday and hope, hopefully win on Sunday and then sell on more of them on Monday. But by 1970, NASCAR allowed a lot of changes. So when you would look under the hood, for example, of a Superbird that Richard Petty was racing, what you'd see are strong crossbars going across. These inner panels were all missing. And as a result, they were changing the suspension underneath, which is a reason why the Superbird, the way it came from the factory, did not have a lot of suspension tweaks to it. It had a few minor ones, but they knew that for the most part, NASCAR said, well, we, we know it's all going to get changed. So Plymouth said, well, there's no reason to make a racing suspension underneath the bottom of this car. So everything that they built was in that direction but not completely. But once again, if you were to look underneath the hood, it would look very different if you see the pictures from Richard Petty's car back in 1970. There were also a lot of strong changes inside the driver's compartment as well. If you notice on the side, on the door, there were strong bars going across, reinforcing so that if it did get an impact on the side, which of course was very common, well, they would be a little bit stronger. It also gave it a stronger structure and less flexing, which of course was very important. The less flexing you got on those super speedways, the more stable the car was as it was going around. So technically, while what they were doing was they were uh, allowing the body to be sold, knowing there were significant changes that were going to happen. And of course, by 1970, that was allowed. In the world we're in now, of course, NASCAR race cars are very purpose-built vehicles. And, and if you look at them, they bear a resemblance to a stock car that would be on the street, but there's a lot of differences. But back then, this was essentially the body that had to be raced exactly the way it is if they were going to go racing in NASCAR. Now, as I mentioned, when they went racing, Richard Petty was very successful, won eight races in 1970, but he did not win the championship. But they did win something that the Dodge Charger Daytona was never able to pull off. They managed to win the Daytona 500 with Pete Hamilton in 1970. Also, if you go back and you look this video of the very first race in 1970, which was not run at Daytona like it is today, it was actually run at Riverside Raceway. It was a road course. And it's kind of fun watching these winged warrior cars with the big nose and the big tail running all over the place. It didn't have the same advantage at Riverside that it was going to have just a few weeks later at Daytona. And once again, Pete Hamilton winning the very first Daytona Tona 500 in 1970 in this car, the first one where they ran the Plymouth Superbird. Now, as I mentioned, the rear wing is not fiberglass. It's actually metal. And the reason being is it had to be strong enough to withstand the aerodynamic forces on a super speedway. They were not just making them for show for the road versions. This was the actual wing that was being used. Now, interestingly enough, the trunk doesn't quite open. And you're like, well, why doesn't it? Well, it's because if you look underneath, what they've done is they've actually welded a very small piece right there underneath the latch to prevent it from going all the way up. It just so happens that that was exactly the amount of space that they needed, and it's still enough for somebody who's using it on the road to be able to get access to their trunk. But that's a little minor modification that they made on all the road runners to turn them into superbirds. Inside, the Superbird is essentially the same thing as the Roadrunner. I mean, if you look at the dash, it's identical. And, and it's interesting because you realize that if you were buying a Superbird, you were paying a lot more than a Roadrunner. Roadrunner, uh, the base was about $2,900, the hardtop was about $3,000. You bought a Superbird, well, back then in 1970, it was going to cost you $4,300. It's a $1,300 premium over the next highest price 
Plymouth Roadrunner. Of course, you were paying for all that aerodynamics, but what you weren't getting was any luxury. That really wasn't the goal of the Plymouth Superbird. Inside, it was essentially the same thing because they didn't need to worry about making sure that there was anything special about that for NASCAR. Inside, all this was going to be disappear when they went NASCAR racing. And for those people buying a Plymouth Superbird, they probably thought, I'm spending an extra $1,300 and all I get is the front and the rear, the nose. I don't actually get to take it NASCAR racing. I just get the look. So essentially the same car inside, it's the outside where the big differences show up. All Superbirds came with a vinyl roof. You might be thinking, well, why would they do that? I mean, after all, back then a vinyl roof was considered an upgrade, right? It was a little fancier. Why would we put a vinyl roof on a car that, of course, when they went racing, was not going to have it. And for people on the street, they probably didn't really care about it. Well, remember I mentioned the fact that they changed the rear window out of this car. As a result, they had to do work around the outside of this. Now, to put on the vinyl roof, what you could do was hide all of that handiwork. If you didn't, well, you'd have to polish it up, paint it, go through a lot of work to get it just right. They didn't want to do that. So underneath here, if you were to take this off, what you'd see is, well, less than perfect smoothing and painting. And the vinyl roof, well, let's just say it, it hid a lot of the flaws that they would have had to fix if they were going to leave that off. Pretty tricky way of solving that problem. So if the Superbird achieved the goal of getting Richard Petty back to Plymouth, winning in NASCAR, in fact, winning the Daytona 500, what happened to it? Well, unfortunately, NASCAR decided that they didn't like where all this was going. The big wings, the purpose-built cars only for the super speedways, only for NASCAR. And so it's interesting. Technically, they did not outlaw that big wing. They did not outlaw that sharp nose on the front. What they did say was, if you're going to run those kinds of things, you're going to have to run a smaller engine. They reduced the allowable engine that you were able to run. And they also said, well, you might also, depending upon the engine, have to run a little more weight as well. So while the wing and the nose were still allowed, the reality was NASCAR made changes that essentially eliminated the Superbird and of course the Dodge Charger Daytona, and of course the Ford Talladega, which was Ford's version of a super speedway car. They eliminated those and cars had to get back to a much more stock configuration. But today, of course, well, the Superbird lives on as a collector car, very unique. Prices have risen tremendously, especially if you have one of those rare 425 horsepower Hemi engines under the hood. But even if all you have is the base 440, with 375 horsepower in that four barrel carburetor, it is still an awesome collectible car. That's why it's this week's collector car profile.